There we go. Just had a few uh, videos playing on that playlist there. Hope that you enjoyed those and that they were a blessing. Um, Sterling here, and welcome again to Cross Allegiance webcast. Another Tuesday night, another you know word about a uh, various topic. So um, yeah, welcome. <laughs> All right, uh, this week we're going to talk about something different. Last week we talked about, well, of course, uh, we talked about. And let me just show the terms. I made this for Marius. Um, we talked about the terms Salah and Afiemi. So you have Apa, which is away from, plus uh, Hiemi, which is uh, to send. So you send away the offense, or, uh, or you pardon something like Salah. And those are the two root words, Hebrew and Greek, for forgiveness. And uh, when we are forgiven, we are totally forgiven. And let's see. Let me find it. There we go. A little boot up fire uh, fireworks here. Let's see if I can get this. There. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't. <laughs> I gave Marius these for the uh, the thumbnail, so he he could actually make that and make it look all fancy. So thanks, Marius. Now we have a thumbnail for that, but Salah and Afiemi, yeah, we are forgiven. Okay, so this week I want to talk about something different and I'm praying about what to talk about. Just all these leadership issues came up and uh, whether it was big in the news or big in evangelical uh, circles or, or whatnot, you had leadership faux pas and errors and... Um, people saying that worship is all about you and that type of thing, or people being kicked out or told to step down from their congregations and, and well-known people. And the prayer is for any one of those, for them to get it right uh, before God, because we're all human, we're all going to make mistakes, but those who teach are going to be held accountable even more severely. So uh, we need to pray for those type of leaders, but I want to examine the characteristics of a godly leader. And talking about God honoring leadership. So some are obvious, and we're going to talk about kind of in an apophatic way, so saying what it's not. What, what, what does a leader exhibit? What doesn't he exhibit? Uh, could be a he or a she. God puts all sorts of people in various leadership roles. And so um, regardless of you know, where you are in your Christian walk, if God has called you to a certain thing, follow that and always measure that by his word. And um, if others are giving you bad advice, hey, go to the Word of God. God has the best advice for every situation. So that's going to be a lot of the focus today, is just looking at the Word of God and seeing, hey, what does God want a leader to exhibit? So uh, I'm thinking about those who lead and, um, and those who have essentially you know, fallen from grace, in a sense, or you know, are being uh, dealt with with church discipline or that type of thing. Uh, let's just take a moment to pray and pray for them to uh, to come to a point of restoration and to get all all that they can right before God, and uh, for us too to have a heart that is moldable and, and really pliable before God, that He can mold us into whatever He wants us to be, and that we can see Him do wondrous things. Because that's uh, part of the amazing thing in in following after God is just you know, we get to see Him do amazing things. So uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into the topic about God-honoring leadership. So let's pray. Father, help us be the best leaders we can be in whatever leadership role you've called us to be. I just pray that, Lord, those who are in leadership would be strengthened by you, that there would be a real revival within leaders worldwide, that in, in the wake of all persecution going on, that we would be resolute and that we would stand firm in the faith, Lord, help us be courageous as we go about following after you. Help us not compromise on your word. Help us always go to you and your word and see what you have to say about things. Help us have an open ear to what you are saying, Lord. Help us stand, uh, stand firm and stand fast in the faith. Just help us be firm. And Lord, help us just go, go to the end. <laughs> help us persevere to the end, Lord. And just be faithful and obedient servants of you. And I just pray that, Lord, anyone who's watching who has a call of God on their life, uh, God, just uh, impress 
your word on their hearts uh, tonight about what you want them to show in leadership roles and yeah, just let that be an encouragement, God. Confirm your calling in so many people's lives through this, God, just by your word. And thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, oh, let's pray one more thing. <laughs> Father, also for those who are in leadership and have gone wrong, I just pray that you would bring restoration and turn them all back to you. Let there be a real heart of repentance in those who have stray, strayed from the faith and who have misled people that there would be a real move of your spirit in their lives that would convict them and change their hearts. I pray that, Lord, and pray to the end of restoration and repentance and that we all might stand faithful before you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, didn't want to forget that part too. And you know, God knows that uh, we want to pray for that, but I, I just want to pray for that. He does amazing things through prayer, and hey, we need to pray. <laughs> so let's, let's keep that in prayer this week for sure. So thinking about leadership, some things are very obvious, all right? So does God want his leader to be proud? Leadership is not proud. It's not all about the leader. It's not leader-centric. It's about God. It's about glorifying him. It's about being obedient to him and seeing him get the glory. He deserves all the glory. And if we think that we deserve all the glory, then we're mistaken. And that's where we start to go wrong, when pride sneaks in. So leadership needs to be humble. Of course, and you think verses like 1 Peter 5, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, and God delights in humility. We see that time and time again. Solomon recommends humility so many times, and that's just one tenet of the faith. We need to be humble, so let's be humble before God. We see the perfect, perfect, perfect example of humility in Jesus Christ, in him lowering himself even to a criminal's death and, thing, and the, uh, the death that he didn't deserve. And he took on all of our sin. He humbled himself even to death on a cross, uh, which is a place of humiliation and suffering and, again, something that he didn't deserve, but he served as our once and for all sacrifice. And as a result of his humility and his obedience, God the Father raised him up, and he's, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, yet to return, and he will return. And whether or not it's going to be in this modern era, boy, signs are sure pointing to Ooh, it looks it looks convincing in some ways, but we always just need to be ready. Because hey, there were people in, I mean, even in the first century, even in the early church, they thought, okay, well, Jesus is going to return here and and now, and we just got to be ready all the time. It's true, we always need to be ready, but we also need to realize that hey, the Antichrist is yet to be revealed. But don't let that you know let that catch you on your heels. You you know always need to be ready in a forward position. It's kind of like in basketball, if you cross someone up, you know, and they're on their heels, they're, they're not going to be able to guard you. They're going to fall over. So uh, people call it breaking your ankles. So you don't want broken ankles. You always want to be ready and be resolute. So my basketball <laughs> terminology here. Um, but again, be ready. So again, uh, with the knowledge of uh, Jesus returning, and he will and he exhibited humility. Let's follow in his footsteps. Uh, we're not the ones who are going to be the main ones returning. <laughs> so we're not following in that aspect. We're not going to become the begotten Son of God. But we can be children of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, as Romans says. And um, so it's, it's just a, a wonderful thing to have the blessing of God uh, in our lives and to follow in his footsteps to model Jesus. So let's be humble. If you're in leadership, be humble. And if you're not in leadership, God has called you to some form of service to him. And regardless of whether it's small or great, just be faithful in it. And again, be humble. You're going to see great results from that. Uh, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. Uh, leadership is also not heavy-handed or iron-fisted. We see a lot of leaders uh, say uh, they're, they're trying to lord it over their subjects. And if you go over to Matthew 20... 20 through 28, and we talked about this in one of the prior weeks as well. The main thing here, starting in verse 25, really, let's go to that, because you know the story. Um, James and John's mother uh, came up to Jesus and said, hey, can my sons have exalted positions when you're in your, in your kingdom? And 
the main idea there, because the ten were also moved with indignation, they were like, no, we want those spots. They're like, I can't believe, I can't believe she would ask that type of question. And especially like, yeah, James and John, come on, man. Uh, so Jesus, again, called them unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are, uh, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. And the contrast here is we're not supposed to lord it over someone. We're not supposed to do stuff out of hierarchy. And there can be a structure, and there can be hierarchy, but it's not out of a root of hierarchy that we do these things when we're following after Jesus. It's There's a serious difference here, so we'll get to that. But who else, who, uh, who else, <laughs> whosoever, I need to get something other than KJV on this thing. Um, KJV is cool, but man, okay. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Uh, and the servant, literally, the, the lowest of them all, and Jesus continues, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. And again, Jesus serving as the example of humility here, but we're not supposed to be heavy-handed. We're not supposed to lord it over our subjects or try to get the grandiose position. We're not supposed to be put on a pedestal. I mean, people might look up to us, but again, we're supposed to be like this, <laughs> pointing to Jesus and not to ourselves, right? Uh, that's, that's dangerous if we say, oh man, I'm so great, I'm so good. And the thing is, God's created us wonderfully. And that's one thing that we can, we can look to and say, God, you've made me awesome. And even as David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and that I know well. And it's very true. God made us wonderfully. And it's great to have self-worth, but if we're saying, I'm so great, I'm so good, instead of, God, you are great, you are good, thank you for all you've given me, and all you are, it's, it's a huge difference. And so leaders who point to themselves and are, uh, are self-centered, prideful, narcissistic, arrogant, those things are going to tear down uh, any sort of leadership in, in Christ, in any ministry. It's going to end up in disaster in some way. And so uh, get, it, get it set early on that you're about the kingdom of God and you're not about your own kingdom. It's not about building up yourself. It's about building up the kingdom of God and serving him and giving him glory. It's not our glory to take. Um, so, again, humble. <laughs> I went back to that. But also, it's supposed to be tender. And we see so many times in Scripture, even the word for, uh, for, uh, for pastor, past, pastor, uh, you have what, poiem, poiema, I believe is the term, and uh, that's literally a shepherd. And uh, you think the, the shepherd takes care of the sheep, the sheep are straying every which way, but the sheep know the shepherd's voice, uh, the shepherd guides the sheep, and takes care of them, loves them, feeds them, nourishes them. Hey, it's what Jesus does with us. He's our good shepherd. And if you think in Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord, Yahweh, Adonai, the great I am, is our shepherd. And who's the good shepherd in John 10? It's Jesus. And Jesus is very, very much in nature God, fully in nature God, and um, the Son of God, uh, an express image of the Father. He's one with the Father. And if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. So we can look to Jesus, who deserves the glory, and yet he was the most humble of us all. <laughs> so we need to model him. Uh, so he was the most exalted, and he's the Son of God, the begotten Son of God, and he came as a, a humble servant. He will return as the King of glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We see that in Revelation 19. He will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So in thinking about heavy handedness and thinking, okay, well, I can't be blessed unless I'm blessed through my pastor. That's total bunk. And that's really a cultic type thing where if someone is saying that they're the mediator between you and Jesus or you and God, that position's already taken. It says, let's, uh, let's go to that verse actually. And I believe it's 1 Timothy 2.5. Yeah, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so you get heavy-handed ministers or leaders in some sort of Christian arena, and they're heavy-handed. And it's one thing, you can be a stern pastor, and if, if you think, oh, well, you know, he dealt with me sternly, sometimes that's the right thing to do. And if we're caught in a sin, we're supposed to 
you know, take that to someone humbly. But then if they, if they don't confess that, take it, take someone else and then bring it before the church. After that, you consider them an, outs an outsider. And that's straight from Jesus in his mediation, I believe, in Matthew 18. Um, and it's something to, to look to, though. We need to deal with sin seriously. You look at Paul in Romans 7, when he talks about his problem with sin, and he's like, I hate this. My flesh keeps doing what I hate to do. And it's like, I don't want to do this, but I keep doing it. And it's this monster that's in our own lives, and we're going to deal with this as long as we're here. But when we become a Christian, that doesn't mean that we are never going to sin again. Even so, it says in 1 John that if we sin, hey, there is a mediator and, uh, b between God and man. And uh, let's, uh, let's 1 John 2, 1. We, we have an advocate with the Father. That was a term. Jesus Christ the righteous. So it's, he says, I write these things so that you will not sin. And, or here, but, in a conjunction form, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we know that, a hey, he is a propitiation for our sins, our payment, our substitutionary sacrifice. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. I always go back to 1 John 1, 9. It's such an awesome, just a, the book's, the book's awesome. It's just great. So full of life. And uh, John's eyewitness account of Jesus in the Gospels and, and his book about even Christian conduct uh, and how we're supposed to behave in love. So much in 1 John. So it's a great book. I would I just encourage you this week to read 1 John. Great book. But again, humility is one thing in leadership. Tenderness is another. And out of that love, love is the, the root there that we need. And so when I said, hey, if church leadership is not out of hierarchy and we see so many you look at blogs all over the place and it's so obsessed with hierarchy hierarchy structure structure but it's gotten away from the love that god wants at the root and you you just read you're like it's just so stale and you think well the pharisees did kind of the same thing they went off and thought oh this law this law this law this law and they got so entrenched in this law that they started saying well i'm really righteous if i obey all these laws and they became hypocrites, and so their hearts were so far from God, uh, and we don't want to get that way. So be in tune with the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the law. Uh, so, uh, And I really should say of, of grace, and because Jesus ushered in really grace um, and fulfilled the law, but it's, we have the letter of the law and the Spirit of the law, and the Holy Spirit always brings liberty, and it's always something to, uh, to be attuned to. And so we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and his voice and always just hey, follow things out of love. Constantly through 1 John, uh, if you love God but you don't love your brother, how can you say you're in the light? So you're not walking with God if you're, if you're hating your brother. Um, and so it's just something to measure. Uh, we need to always lead out of love. Godly characteristic. Um, so again, structure in God's kingdom is out of root of love and not hierarchy. And it does have structure and hierarchy, but it's the opposite of what you would expect. We're supposed to, as leaders, serve others. And so we're literally, we're more of at the bottom. It's like an upside down triangle that we're leaders, but we're serving those and supporting those above and those who, those who are God's sheep and those who God calls us to minister to, even those who uh, are his lost sheep, but you have yet to believe. And so those who will come to know Jesus. Um, so just be, just be faithful in, in serving God and in humility. Um, so, let's see, a good model. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, talking about just some attributes of a leader, um, 1 Timothy 3, starting at verse 1, talking about the office of a, a bishop. And here, uh, we'll just read through it, and I'll go through the highlights here, and really a summary of all these attributes and talk through some of these points. But 1 Timothy 3, this is also parallel, paralleled in Titus chapter 1, and Peter also talks about this a lot in 1 Peter 5 and a lot of how we should have a, again, tender heart uh, as we obediently tend to the flock that Jesus has given us. So, all right, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, nor not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. 
For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, or who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We see later on also deacons are given uh, very similar character traits. And, um, and so Paul is saying to Timothy here as well, these are some attributes to look for in, in a godly leader. And um, so just let's, let's look through this. And the, the main heading, bishop then must be blameless or above reproach. And being above reproach is really not being spoken against for any just reason. And uh, anyone who leads a church or leads a body of believers needs to exhibit the, um, the wisdom in living out his life in a blameless way. And uh, a man of God being blameless and keeping his nose clean. You think of so many church leaders who just fell into this ridiculous sin. And then, you know, it's, there goes their credibility, there goes their ministry. But to have someone who walks the walk, talks the talk, and gives no, you know, foothold for Satan, uh, and uh, keeps his nose out of trouble, uh, avoids the appearance of evil, loves scripture, it's, it's, it's great to have a good example, and we need to be in that line. And, you know, when we see God, may we be found faithful and to be blameless before him throughout our years. Um, here also, uh, monogamous and... It's interesting here because uh, if you look at church history, a lot of the a lot of the bishops or, or the pastors or overseers were single, and this is one thing here where it's talking about again a bishop here, but also elders were given similar traits as well. Uh, they should be monogamous. They should be pure. They should not be lecherous. They should be obedient to God's laws of sexuality. And so, almost everyone was going to be married. And if you look at stats today, it's in the 90s percents. Um, <coughs> 90s percent, <laughs> there we go, um, of people who will eventually get married. And, um, and unfortunately, too, there, there are people who continually, continually get married time and time again and then go through divorce and all that. That's, that's not God's plan. But someone who is faithful, someone who's committed to marriage, and it's interesting as well because you see also instances in which if someone was not a believer and they had a divorce and they just completely changed because of Christ, that's a, that's a clean slate. And so you wonder, okay, well, where does this stop? And let the Word of God and, and really uh, your conscience between you and the Holy Spirit be your guide. If you're, say, on a church search committee or something like that, and you run into someone who, uh, who has that and they had a dramatic conversion, they, they say they were divorced before, and now they're either celibate and uh, committed to that, or hey, they found another, another wife who's now a believer and they're serving God together. It's just, you know, you need to discern in each situation. And uh, I know Timothy would have had that latitude, but again, these are some really good guidelines. Most people are going to be married. And in this case, too, uh, we have a lot of cues here. So uh, literally elder here, or I, I guess this, this is bishop, but if you, if you compare that with elder as well, another good example of leader. Um, husband of one wife, faithful. A lot of people think this also talks against uh, monogamy, or what am I saying? <laughs> polygamy. <laughs> talks against polygamy and for monogamy. There we go. So, um, and that that was in existence in the Roman Empire, but I don't think that's really what it was speaking to as much. And if you go to, let's just look it up in the Greek here, First um, Timothy three and First uh, Timothy three. Let's see. All right, verse two. So again, above reproach or beyond reproach here. And then, so a one woman man, literally one woman or one wife man, and someone who's committed to purity. And I guess the thing, when I, when I went to seminary and uh, one, of the, one of the teachers of the gospels uh, discussed this, this topic, and I know it was a Gospels class, it was actually a Gospel of Mark class, but, um, but he very much tried to encourage those who had a call in their life to pastoral ministry and were single, and some older and who weren't planning on getting married or who had committed their lives to full-time, yeah, just staying single and being celibate. And there are people like that. Uh, I'd say it's extremely rare, and nowadays in this really sexualized culture, it's, it's much more of a temptation to, uh, 
you know, to, to go after something against just singleness. If you compare with the monastic age all the way through the Reformation, it was a bragging point to be a single minister. And it's interesting that, well, Martin Luther may have been more influential in this than we give him credit for, but when he renounced his monastic vow over time and said, oh, well, it's okay, it's okay for someone to, you know, get rid of their monastic vow, realizing that it was an improper vow, as well as it's okay for them to marry, and then he married, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well, hey, maybe that was extremely influential, and we see from that point on, and especially through that, and then you look at American history, and then colonial America, marriage is a good thing. That's very true, but a lot of singles have been ignored by a lot of churches, and uh, may God restore the heart for all people in all walks of life, because you go to churches, and it's all about, well, so-and-so has this family, and we're going we're gonna to preach to families, and that's it, but the singles make up at least 43%, and up to 52%, based on whatever uh, Census Bureau study you look at, um, and it seems to be increasing. We need more people who are single and who are serving God. And Paul gives very uh, encouraging words to those who are single. And he says it's a it's good for a man not to it's good for a man not to marry. Was Paul wrong? God did say it's not good for man to be alone. God created woman and gave man a wife. And he who finds a wife finds a good thing. But it's also true that. Hey, we can follow after Jesus if God has called you to be celibate, and that meaning that you have no desire for a family, you just you want to serve God, and that's what you want to do. And if God changes your heart on that, and through a season says, hey, you're going to have a family, I want to provide this for you, great. That's not a knock to you, that's just, hey, God has called you in this manner. But again, as Jesus said, not everyone can receive that, <laughs> and it's not for everyone. Um, and I say it's, it's for an extreme minority. So... Okay, the main points here. That professor said, if Jesus or Paul can't be the pastor of, of a church, I don't really want to go there. And if that's the issue, and saying, well, a single can't speak to a married couple, what are we going by? Are we going by experience? Experience can help, but we need to go by the Word of God. The Word of God is our standard. The Word of God speaks to every situation. And in, in my experience, just the Word of God does so much, even when I have no experience, Relating to someone else's experiences, we have something similar that we may have gone through, but God's Word speaks to everything. And it's also in, in, uh, interesting, too. Do I, do I want to partake in sexual sin so that I can speak to those who have experienced sexual sin? Or do I need to be a drug dealer to speak to a drug dealer? No. The Word of God deals with those things and says, hey, this is right and this is God's will. So we stand on God's word, and I just hope that's an encouragement to those who are single and who are striving to serve God. Maybe you've been fed discouraging words, even from well-meaning people, but God desires in whatever state of life you are to be faithful to whatever he's called you to do in that season, and regardless of whether a calling is long-term, which it can be, or whether it's for a season, and hey, if, if you're single and God tells you, hey, do this, do it by all means, because you're going to give an account to God. And if God tells you in another season, okay, well, this season's done. Let's move out and, uh, and do this. Do this other thing. Follow after him. Just follow after him. He'll never lead you astray. And following after Jesus is never going to be a boring thing. And he's, he's always going to give you something that's going to end up in your, your blessing. That's God's heart. And some seasons may be harder than others, but, hey, that's just something to, to remember, that God always desires your blessing. Regardless of whether it's spiritual, it can be financial. Hey, that's not a guarantee, though. You look at people like Job, who went through seasons of extreme, extreme persecution on, on prosperity. Uh, that kind of a, that's a knock to, uh, to any sort of health and wealth. That Sometimes God wants us to be poor. And James also talks about the riches that spiritually are within the group that have neglected money. And uh, those who were poor were often the most spiritually rich. Um, so just be discerning in what God has called you to do. Obey him and don't listen to words that don't come from God's word. Um, always measure things by what the word of God says. And again, if, if you're in a season in which you've been discouraged, but you know that God has told you to do something, don't let that discouragement weigh you down and you know, take away that blessing that God wants you to have by obeying him. Um, uh, 
And the other thing too, in, in mentioning the, the whole call to singleness, that type of thing, is also it's not an it's not an unfair thing or an ungodly thing to uh, to go and search for uh, for a wife if if you're a man and you're single. It's not a sin to search for a wife if that's the desire that God has placed on your heart. It's something that it's between you and the Lord and whoever you marry. I mean, that's the covenant you make eventually when you marry. It's between you, your spouse, and God. It's not just between you and your spouse and, and the government or uh, another party. It's, it's, about, it's about the covenant that you make between you, your spouse, and God. Saying, hey, I'm going to take care of this person. I'm, I'm going to be faithful to this person. And hey, let's you know this is our family, um, and that's a commitment you make between you and God. But uh, if you are not called to singleness and celibacy, I know a lot of people who say, "Well, I kiss dating goodbye," um, that type of thing. But um, just a warning that uh, that book was not about uh, a shunning of dating. That's not what the book's about, and. It's kind of annoying to me that uh, Josh Harris let that creep out and just kind of turn into that because he made a blog post about that, I think, within like the last two years. Uh, and it's, it's really unfortunate what happened with the congregation um, and, and all that ordeal. And again, we need to pray for him and C.J. Mahaney, all them. But even so, he's, he made a blog post that was just like, you know, this little post in the middle of nowhere saying, no, this isn't what my book was about, but that's not... And, and that's not what we go by either. It's, but it seems that this generation just has this mentality of, oh, well, I'm, not, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to let this fall into my lap. You know, sometimes we have to take action where God has given us desires. But again, commit that to God. Trust in him. And if God has put that desire in your heart for, uh, for a spouse, go for it. You know, that's, that's one thing. So that's, that's always something to, to keep in mind that not all are called to singleness. And so, again, sometimes God calls us to different things in different periods of our lives as well. And maybe he's called you to be a pastor, and maybe he wants you to wait until you have a family. And here we have multiple children, that type of thing. Uh, here doesn't mean that um, children here has to be plural for you to be a pastor. That's definitely not true. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's something that, just, just to balance out, I don't want to speak about this topic. I know it's pretty volatile, but um, a, lot of, a lot of people have been mistreated uh, from that demographic, and I just want to be clear on, on what the Word of God says and just some encouragements that I think are, are biblical. And again, check it over in the Word and, you know, come to, between you and God, come to a conclusion on what you need to do. All right, so um, again, we need to be pure. We need to be temperate. Uh, patient with others, not given to rage. Again, tender-hearted. Um, again, attributes of a leader here. We need to be prudent and wise. You think of King Solomon when Solomon had to lead uh, a, the con the whole congregation of Israel uh, before the divided kingdom, uh, which also was unfortunate. Uh, but um, but before the before the divided kingdom, we have the golden age of Israel, and that was you know under King Solomon. And this luxurious temple where everyone came to worship and it, everything was great. Uh, but King Solomon was, uh, until Jesus, the most wise man who ever lived. And we see just time and time again, people would come from all over the world to see him. Or just the world at that time. <laughs> they didn't fly via plane or whatever and, you know, charter a, a plane to fly out and see Solomon. But... It's actually the equivalent of what they had back then, but they didn't have airplanes back then. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> you talk about an anachronism. Um, it's like, yeah, Jesus stepped out of the helicopter. No, <laughs> not yet, right? Maybe when he returns uh, one day, he'll, he'll. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> he has, he has his, his own stuff that's, uh, that's much better. Um, okay, so... Uh, Anyway, <laughs> back on topic, we need to be wise. We need to be prudent and wise. God calls us to serve in, in various ways, and we need to be ready for that. And often, he'll give us, again, the wisdom to deal with those things. And James 1.5, again, actually, I will stick here in 1 Timothy 3, but James 1.5, we ask God for wisdom, and we need to ask in faith. Hey, he'll give us his abundance of wisdom, and he is the source of all true wisdom. So, and asking him for wisdom, hey, we're going to the best source. But we need to be wise, and again, God grants that. 
So be prudent, be wise. Uh, also be respectable. So you need to live a godly life, serve as a good model for others to live after. Uh, be hospitable, be warm, welcoming. And that's not necessarily just like, you know, greet someone at the door. That can be a form of, of hospitality, but we see in the uh, early church especially that you know, people would meet in homes and they would, they would welcome others, they would, uh, they would have communion together, and uh, they, they were called love feasts there where they would break bread together, they would, they would worship God, sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and yeah, just worship God. So there would be time for that as well as the word. A lot of what church services look like today, and that's what they're modeled after, it's what the early church did in worshiping the Lord. Um, a lot of that also is a carryover from temple worship in which they'd study the word and, and have worship. So, um, and even going up to the temple, there were psalms of ascents that people would sing and uh, little things that say you go up for Passover. So you, you literally are going up because it's on a mountain uh, in Jerusalem and you know, you're going to worship and hey, you have all these psalms. So Psalm 120 through 135 are the psalms of ascent. So when people would go up, literally ascend to worship, they would sing those songs. So worship was a continual thing. Uh, not just outside, uh, or what am I saying? Not not just one day of the year, right? Or, you know, during a feast or during the feasts. Um, we're supposed to always be in, uh, have a heart of worship and, and recognition that, hey, God's watching, God's here, let's honor God, and yeah, let's make him proud. Um, okay, so you also, so hospitable, that's one thing. Able to teach or apt to teach. And that's critical when it comes to the Word of God. You look at people like Moses, who had serious speech impediments, and yet God found a way through Aaron, his spokesman, <laughs> for him to be able to speak. And God is, is merciful to those situations. And in a lot of cases, too, you, know, you can look at various preachers who are like, well, I had a, a call to ministry, and I couldn't speak worth a lick, but you know, God developed that talent as I went through, or you know, he healed stuttering, he did this, that, or the other, so that I could obey his calling. And that's awesome, and, and God's very much in that. He still heals today, and uh, whatever situation he calls you to do, he will equip you, regardless of whether you think you're the best or the worst at a certain situation, or, or a certain skill, I guess. Uh, you know, God will make it happen. He, he, he's faithful. Who calls you, who else will do it or bring it to pass? And so God doesn't give you something as a calling just to... Um, you know, just to shame you. He, he doesn't want to shame you. He's not there to abuse you. He's not there to harm you. He's there for your, your hope and a future, just like Jeremiah 29, 11. And it's, you think of Jeremiah 29, 11, and just the heart that God has for you. And, you know, it's, it's kind of that, the love that looks at someone and is just in absolute, uh, just lovesickness and a continual persistent love faithful and just God is all those things and and he looks at his people even when they were uh, disobeying him and in exile and uh, and saying hey I have plans to prosper you for hope and a future and even when you have done the very worst God still receives you with open arms just like that prodigal son and when you return to God he's there with the robe waiting the the, uh, the best robe the the fatted calf sacrificed for you and um he just he wants to greet you with 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 a huge hug and uh and and love and that's his heart he doesn't want to shame you so god's going to call you to to something where it may stretch you but he's always going to be out for your good it's very true and so his heart is for your good um so always keep that in mind we're always lied to by the enemy in various ways and one of the ways he lies is to say that God doesn't care about you, God doesn't love you, God doesn't do this, that, or the other for you, but it's that's not true. God very much is out for your blessing. Um, so just always keep that in mind and, and speak words of truth that God has spoken. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He, he, even though we were sinners and we were his enemies, Christ died for us, so we have his love. <clears throat> We also, okay, so able to teach, let's, let's go back to that too. We need to be able to teach the Word of God. We also need to know the Word of God. That's so critical. We need to spend time with God and, you know, be with Him. If you go to someone who doesn't believe that God exists, it's kind of parallel to, okay, well, you know, I, I go shopping at Kmart. 
<laughs> I keep using Kmart as an example. I don't know why. Uh, but I go shopping at Kmart, and Kmart's just this really cool place with all these great deals and all the best things. And I'm just like, man, you got to come to Kmart. And if someone has never seen Kmart before, never experienced Kmart, they're like, well, Kmart? There's no such thing as Kmart. Like, yeah, there is. And Kmart is so full of <laughs> so full of love. I don't know. So full of great deals. Um, but so, Kmart's full of good things. And I've spent all my time at Kmart. I can tell I can tell everyone all about Kmart, but it's not going to be fully real to them until they come to Kmart and see, oh, wow, this is really amazing. And again, this is not a Kmart sponsored show. <laughs> it probably should be at this rate with all that uh that favor those favorable statements. But you know, it's it's all about uh, it's all about knowing him, being with him, and experiencing all all of him and spending time with him, knowing his word. If we don't spend time with him, how are we going to tell how tell everyone else how great he is? The more we spend with more time we spend with him, there we go. <laughs> the more we can tell others about him and and our time with him and it's what he's been teaching us and what we've uh, learned from his word and experienced through our walk of life and him delivering us through various situations, through thick and thin. We can only do that if we really spend time with him. So we need to spend time with God and be, again, apt to teach, able to teach the word of God and knowing what it says, being clear-minded about it and realizing, hey, we may not see the entire picture of all these doctrines. We can agree on the essentials. Jesus is Lord of all. <laughs> There's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus is the only way to God. Uh, the essentials, uh, but you know, we we need to research what the Word of God has to say and and really spend time deciphering. Hey, well, what about this doctrine? What about this? But again, not getting so caught up in it that we neglect to see that the Holy Spirit is in the Scriptures so deeply, and experiencing His teaching through our time with Him is always extremely important. So. Don't get so, you know, pharisaic there. <laughs> uh, you know, dot, dot the I's, cross the T's with every single, uh, you know, possible doctrinal combination that you're like, oh, we'll have to fill, I have to do this, 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 and this, because then it becomes a to-do list. You're like, oh, I did this, and I believe this doctrine, I believe this doctrine, and it's like, okay, but, you know, <laughs> your whole rest of your life is a disaster because you've let it you know, you've you've neglected to spend time with God, and you've been like a monster to everyone, uh, or you've been yelling at everyone because you're like, well, you're not doing this. Um, so we don't want to get caught up in that. Always leave room for the Holy Spirit. All right, what else? Not given to wine, so not a drunkard. We need to be self-controlled and disciplined. It's interesting there too. It's not talking about drinking altogether. Uh, Jesus and the wedding at Cana you turn water into wine. Uh, Jesus at Passover and, uh, and the Last Supper, we see, um, yeah, I, I definitely believe that was wine. Uh, and it's not a sin to drink, but drunkenness is definitely a sin. So that was the line, and you know, we can discern what the line is. But again, um, we just need to be responsible with this. Uh, even Paul said to, to Timothy in a medicinal use here that, you know, take some wine for your stomach's sake. I've actually never had any alcohol. <laughs> I guess you can count. I, I had a cup of NyQuil once when I was uh, when I was a kid, when I was sick. I think that's just about. Oh, I did have communion one time. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, that was wine. I mean, that's you know we, we commit that to God, and and that's fine. Sometimes it could be a matter of conscience and that type of thing. When I was ordained as a pastor with the ECA, also I, I signed an agreement that, and it wasn't really an issue with me at all. It's just. Okay, well, you know, to be above reproach in this society, it's a good idea, and it's wise to avoid alcohol. And if you're not legalistic about that, and you're like, okay, well, I'm giving this up because I want to, you know, provide a pure example for others, that's completely fine. I, I had no problem with doing that. Um, but this, this isn't saying that you have to sign an agreement like that, this, this passage, but it's saying, hey, you, you don't want to have someone, you know, sloshed, go and try to teach your, your Sunday school. Right? I mean, it's like if you're hungover, you, how are you going to teach about self control? Or uh, how are you conducting your life? And people, and to be, uh, to be fully, uh, fully fair here, too, 
I mean, sometimes people go through season in which they, uh, they fall into certain sins or they have a family in which there's a history of alcoholism and that type of thing. And you want to be compassionate to that as well. So um, while I say that in jest, I also recognize, hey, there, there are people with, with all sorts of problems that we need to, to help, help out with and, and encourage them against. So, um, so anyone going through that too, it's just, uh, you know, we need to be self-controlled and disciplined. That's, that's the main thing. And, uh, and in, in what we eat or drink too, that's also important. Um, so show, show modesty in that too. Um, okay. So, uh, don't start any brawls or have tendencies that way. So not a, not a striker, uh, also gentle. That's also related. So again, having tenderness and not being bellicose and pugnacious or whatever other word you want to use for, for violent. <laughs> um, so you know, it's not someone who's going to disagree with someone and yell them into the ground or do something they're going to regret or belittle someone out of just your own pride because you're talking down to them. Um, that's not the way a, a good leader, a good godly leader should be. So again, gentle, um, uncontentious, not a lover of money. That's another one where we're not obsessed with, with money. And that's another way you can get entrapped too, is you have so many leaders who obsess with money and who are motivated by money. And all these scams come out because, oh, well, you know, so this much because I need this much. Um, we need to give according to what God has put on our hearts. And sometimes if, if, if God tells a man of God or, you know, someone in ministry, hey, ask for this, hey, it's, it's fair for them to ask for that. But, um, but always have that between you and God, that some people are so motivated by money that they are turned away from God and really are walking apostate and without the spirit of God. They deceive many people and they need to be avoided. But that's what the love of money can do. But the love of money is the root of all evil, in which hey, you can't serve God and mammon or money. It's either one or the other. And so when you serve God, it doesn't mean that hey, you can't take care of your pastor. It, it says also that the, uh, the um, let's see, double honor, double honor. Uh, t let's see. Let's, let's look at double honor. I'm using Turbo Bible to search here. Let me get the exact passage here. Look first Timothy five. Yeah. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine, in the word and doctrine. And you look back in Acts chapter six and uh, that's actually okay, keep that keep that verse in mind. Acts chapter six four yeah. Um at that time in Acts, the apostles were like, well, we, we need to focus on the word and prayer. And they said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Two key things in our uh, in, in the leadership role, in God-honoring leadership, we need to be devoted to prayer and to the word of God. And, you know, being apt to teach, but also being in tune with the spirit and, sorry, <laughs> and, and leading according to how God wants you to lead. Um, but... There are different roles, and we see that a uh, serving tables, they had to deal with the uh, the daily ministration, so essentially food and provision to, to widows, and it was very much the heart of the apostles to say, well, they need provision, and we need, to, we need to, uh, to provide for them, they need to be taken care of, that's very much the heart of God, is to take care of the widows. So they weren't saying, well, we're not going to do that because, you know, we're, we're so far above that. They're like... Now, you know, we need to focus on this because this is becoming a distraction for us. But let's get some men who can oversee this and take care of this administration of, of needs. And that's how deacons came about, or diakonos, those who serve and literally minister to tangible needs. And if you have deacons in a church, those are supposed to be like, well, if someone's sick, you can bring them a meal or visit them in the hospital. Oh, that's awesome. Um, pastors could do that too. I mean, there's, there's a pastoral care has room for that as well, but... Those are great times, and, and seeing, you know, just visiting people when they're sick, and it, it really, um, it means probably more than most people would say, uh, but that, that act of mercy and saying, well, you're important to me, and I'm taking time out for you is, is really a great way of showing the love of God. Um, but again, people have different roles as well, and there are different types of leadership, and uh, you see that in elders versus deacons as well. Uh, and um, it seems to be a little bit of a lesser requirement. The, the deacons aren't really devoted to teaching so much, and not the word in prayer, but 
they're dealing with administration and, and God gives people gifts in those in those categories in serving others or mercy slash compassion gifts and God blesses those and if, if God has called you to that ministry be faithful in that if you're not called to be an apostle or a prophet or a pastor or an evangelist or a teacher one of those offices in ministry it's most likely that God has called you to do something in in serving him and regardless of whether that's your call or not, God has a role for you, and whether you're faithful and obedient in it or not is how he's going to look at it. And so if God calls you to be the best programmer in the world for his glory, <laughs> or, you know, God calls you, to, um, God calls you to be the best businessman you can possibly be for him, or if God calls you to be the, the best, um, you know, um, Aldersman, whatever whatever it is, or whatever, if it's a small role or if it's a great role in your own sight, uh, that doesn't matter. You just need to be faithful, and God will look at it as, hey, this is my faithful, my good and faithful servant. So just be faithful in whatever he's called you to do. Um, but again, some are, some are called to prayer and the word, some are called to serving others. Uh, but again, hey, we need to... Um, to just be faithful in whatever God gives us. All right, back to the attributes, though. Um, so starting again in First Timothy. Uh, not a lover of money. Avoid, 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 and not avoid. Don't avoid money. Just be a wise manager of it, and don't worship money. Uh, always give. When God brings in a harvest, always give him the first fruits, and you're always going to see him, him bless. We have promises in Scripture relating to that as well. So whether you see that now or in the age to come or in eternity, God's going to bless you for that. You've been obedient with your funds. You've given to him. You've put him as a priority and said, hey, God, all of what you've given me is, is from you, and really it's yours. And having a heart of obedience and giving to God and saying, God, well, what do you want me to support? Uh, do you want me to support this, that, or the other? It could be a local church. Could be a missionary, could be this, that, or the other, but you know whatever it is, just be faithful in giving to God, and and He will bless whether here or in eternity. If you look at Malachi three, that's a very convincing uh, passage where it says, "Hey, give give to me, and watch what I'll do. I'll give you something so big that you can't even handle it." And uh, just the abundance that God desires to to bring to your life is is just wonderful. Uh, so so walk in that. Uh, we also need to be good managers. Leaders need to be good managers. It serves as a symbol of what, uh, what others will do with, with uh, something bigger, or church assembly, so like the little things. It's not referring to, like you don't have to have an, M an MBA. That's an NBA. <laughs> you don't have to be in the NBA. Uh, you don't have to have a Master's of Business Administration in order to be a good manager. If you're taking care of your family, you're providing you're uh, taking care of your children as best as you can. Maybe you're going through hard times. That can be understandable. Um, but, you know, God knows the situation. Uh, but being faithful in those things is, is great. And, and having children that are not unruly, they're not crazy children who haven't been disciplined, you know, you've been faithful in being a good parent, that's one good sign in saying, hey, well, this, this man's going to be a good leader in, in a church assembly. Cool. Um, so good manager and an effective leader you don't want to get too wrapped up in this whole leadership uh, mentality where it's like, oh, everyone's a cookie cutter. Uh, what am I saying? What's a cookie <laughs> Leaders are, uh, cookie cutter leaders are all that you should look for. So you look at even applications for church positions. It's like, we want you, we want a man preferably 46, married with two kids. It's like, 46 and two, two kids like did, did you have to plan this out 10 years in advance i mean what what are they really looking they're looking for someone who they think is exactly the pastor that they would imagine as oh this is going to be the perfect leader going to bring in people it's going to be he's going to be charismatic and it's going to be great are we going to be like this other church who it's this church is huge and it has he has oh man we're going to follow all these principles that this one church did we're going to copy them and we're going to be so huge because that's what we want to be. And I guess your building fund can be taken care of in that sense. But if the Holy Spirit is in a move that re requires you to be faithful, not copy another church, but just follow after his leading and do something totally unique for his glory, I mean, wh why not follow him? <laughs> uh, just, you need to follow what the Holy Spirit has for you. And 
I mean, I can't stress that enough. His, we have so many copycats and cookie cutters that y you have been made unique. God has made you unique. And when he made you, he broke the mold. There is not another you. And even when you think of twins or triplets, when there's a lot of, where there's a lot of similarities, there are, hey, you're still unique. <laughs> you see twins who try to be polar opposites because they're so much alike. Um, but, you know, we're, we're each individual and we each have a spirit and we each have an eternal portion that we will either rise or fall before God in the end. And we're unique. And so why not be unique? Just be who you are and just follow after what God has for you. Uh, that's that's going to be critical. So um, why not do that instead of trying to copy everyone? <laughs> that's one of the main things. So just be faithful to what God has for you and seek him. Spend time with him. That's, that's, that's the big thing. Just spend time with him and listen for him be open to what he has for you that's going to be so huge and just watch him do amazing things he does so many unique things and he has a character he has a way that he operates but you know god works through all sorts of of, of manners if, you, if god has a population of people that no one else has reached and god has has given you that one talent that like no one else has or will use maybe they have that talent but they haven't used it this one portion of people will never hear the gospel unless you use it as he intends. And so again, he gives you all these things for a purpose and he wants to use it uniquely. So just be just be in, in tune to that. <laughs> just be faithful to that and just watch him work. That's that's the big thing. So your life is not going to look like anyone else's. Stop comparing yourself. Just be you. Trust in God. Follow him. Let him provide everything as as he intends in his timing. And yeah, I'll watch him do wondrous things. Um, we also need to be a good steward of what God has given us. Uh, good stewardship is, is huge. So um, everything that is under our care should, should have some sort of order. And we need to be responsible in taking care of what he's given us. Uh, including, you know, if you have a congregation or if you have um, really, really anything, like a, a family... Uh, it could be, it could be your Xbox, it could be your, your Wii, whatever, whatever he's given you, whatever he's allowed you to have, just make sure that you're taking care of everything that he's given you, and, you know, it doesn't have to be to an OCD level, but just, just be faithful in, in taking care of all that he's given you. Uh, time is huge, good, re good manager of your time, uh, your energy, another one, uh, do you rest each week? Man, you got to take time to rest, if at all possible. Um, it's a way of honoring God, too. I'm not saying, hey, rigidly, you know, do this, that, and the other, but you're honoring God by, by following after the Sabbath. That's the pattern that he had for us anyway. So we're going to experience a blessing if we, if we honor him in that. Um, okay, anyway, uh, we need to be grounded in the faith as well. And I, I'm reminded by uh, one passage. Uh, one more thing first, I'll go to that passage. Uh, man, uh Man of God needs to be, or godly leadership, really, um, it needs to be of good reputation or standing with the community or with the world outside. And this doesn't mean compromising. It does mean standing firm in the faith and, and keeping to the word of God and speaking forth. It says, speak the truth in love. That means we need to speak. We need to speak, but we also need to do it in love. And, uh, and people are missing out on, on the whole speak because they're trying to be so loving that they're compromising and they don't say anything. That's what we need to avoid. We need to tell others about Jesus because, hey, otherwise we're saying, hey, well, you don't need Jesus anyway, so, I mean, I'm not going to tell you about him. Or, like, oh, are you going to find out the secret about uh, about me, about Jesus? Like, you know, he's, he's my savior, but you get to find it out because it's a secret. That's not how God wants you to live. We need to be light shining. We're not supposed to be under, um, under a filter or not displayed and... Um, yeah, we, we just need to shine forth. But again, a good reputation, standing in the community, that, that ties in with above, above reproach. But, um, but again, just whatever God has called you to do, um, you can look at these leadership attributes and, and various other passages as well. But this, this is a good list to, to model and just to uh, look at godly conduct. You can look at Romans 12, great chapter on that as well. Um, but also, 1 Corinthians it's 16, 13. Yeah, this verse. Watch ye. <laughs> Stand fast in the faith. 
quit you like men. <laughs> Be strong. All right, so if you look at the terms here, um, let's see. Quit you like men is the the confounder there, but I'll I'll, I'll get to that. First uh, Corinthians sixteen thirteen. Okay, so let's see if I can put this underneath. There we go. Sixteen thirteen. Okay, so watch ye, or literally keep watch. So be watchful. Stand fast in the faith. Be steadfast in the faith. Is literally stand, stand firm in the faith. Um, quit you like men, which just means act like a man or be be courageous in this sense, and that's literally what it means. Um, and then um, be strong. That's literally just be strong. <laughs> Become strong. Be strong. And the imperatives there. There's great things for a leader to do. You think of Joshua when God told him, be strong and courageous. That's what we need to be. We need to be strong. We need to be courageous. We need to be faithful. We need to stand firm in the faith. Realize that God has given us his word for our benefit and for our instruction and for, you know, as a standard uh, for living. So again, in being a leader, and if you're, uh, if you're trying to be in a eldership type position or a bishop, that's one thing we need to be apt to teach as well. So we need to know what the Word of God says, and that's that's never going to hurt. Um, but overall, just thinking of godly leadership, um, we just need to be, again, faithful to what God has called us to do. Each each thing that God calls us to do will be unique and We'll have various things that uh, will be unique to that task in terms of what we need to to specifically learn. And sometimes God will bring us through a season in which we do something, we learn through that season for something else he wants us to do as well. Other times he just wants to develop us. I think that's that's pretty important too. And that God wants us to develop into the full maturity of the Christian faith. And as we follow Jesus, we may need to develop certain fruits of the Spirit, or certain fruit of the Spirit, there we, fruits of the Spirit, um, certain fruit of the Spirit or results of the Spirit's work. So say we're, we're not gentle or we're, uh, we're going through a period in which we're just, we're not patient. Uh, God, can, God can help us through and develop those, those uh, works of the Spirit, those, those results of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in our, in our lives so that hey, we're developing into more and more uh, mature believers. We can make disciples better. We can see, hey, you delivered me through this God, or you developed this in me, and we can give him the glory. And it's all to, it's all to everyone's benefit. It's for his glory. It's like, it's like when uh, this, this week just hearing, oh, we don't do worship for God. We do it all for ourselves. Like, what? 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 Um, so it's just, it's, it's not, a, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not us centric. And while there is some truth in that saying, okay, we worship God. One, he deserves glory. But two, it is for our benefit in a way. I mean, we, we develop uh, a heart of gratitude, a heart of love for him. We gather together as a community of believers, not forsaking the assembling together of believers. We worship God together, and it's an encouragement. It's iron sharpening iron, and it's just a great, wonderful time in which we can come closer to God uh, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you, and He will draw near to us. And so, through our worship, it's it's also it's for our benefit. But again, it's it's so much centered on God. <laughs> it's, it's so important. Um, you see, you know, w without Jesus, all things would just spin off into chaos. You look at Colossians one, a very good passage on that. But again, leadership uh, always be humble, be tender-hearted, be full of love. Learn those things that God wants you to do. Listen to him and spend time with him. Know what the word of God says. Be ready for whatever he calls you to do. And again, if God calls you to something unique in, in whatever season of life, whether you have a ring or you don't, or yet even. And uh, in a lot of our cases too, uh, I know that a lot of us anticipate, hey, okay, I think God's going to bring someone. Cool. But in this season, just be sure that you're being faithful in whatever God calls you to do. And you don't wait for the next season that you think is going to come. Because so you can always go into a holding pattern in which nothing gets accomplished because you're like, oh, well, I'll just wait until this or I'll wait until, um, 
you know, I'll wait until the kids are out of the house to do this, or I'll wait until I'm done with college to do this, or I'll wait until I'm, you know, I'll wait until I'm, is, is, is dangerous if God has called you to do something now. Um, so just be, be patient with that. Sometimes God calls us to say, uh, to do things like, um, to, to finish college and then do something or saying, Hey, I want you to do this eventually. <laughs> Do this now in preparation and that type of thing. There's also room for that. But just be sure you're listening to God. And again, just ask for, for God to guide you by his Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of, he is the spirit of truth. He's going to lead you into all truth. Uh, but we need to, again, spend time with him and, yeah, trust in him. And he, he'll lead us on. He is the best leader that we can ever have. He created leadership. He, he is leadership. He models it. And we look at Jesus. Again, humility, not heavy-handed, not narcissistic, not motivated by money and greed, but motivated out of love. And not over-structural, but out of love. <laughs> We're supposed to lead. So, I hope that was helpful, and uh, I trust that it was, but, uh, but God bless you. And um, I got one more thing to show you on a current project, but... Um, but again, let's, let's close in prayer so we, we can, you know, deal with that next thing. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and just how clear it is on so many things. We just praise you for all that you've spoken about leadership. God, all those who are in leadership, we just pray for. Help us, help us all be strong. Help us be faithful and obedient to you, Lord. We just give you the glory. Thank you for creating us and creating us so wonderfully. But it speaks to you and, and just how great you are. Father, I just pray that we would be good leaders, and we'd be humble, we'd be tender-hearted, we'd be full of love and compassion, that, Lord, if we've messed up in any way, we've, if we've sinned in our leadership, that we'd come to a point of repentance and restoration, that, Lord, everyone who um, has fallen, even publicly, would just come to a point of, of repentance and cleanliness before you, that purity, that, Lord, when, when they stand before you, that... Uh, even as we're going to give an account for everything that we do and say and think and all, all that, Lord, that they would eventually just say, hey, I believe in Jesus. I've, you know, I, I sinned against you, but you forgave me, and it's all to your glory. But, God, I just pray for those who are, um, also as we we discuss this too, and you know that, Lord, with uh, with singleness, I just pray for all those who are single and who are waiting uh, on your provision God, give, uh, give everyone clarity in what to do, whether to search out, uh, whether to, to wait in a certain manner. Uh, God, whatever it is, just uh, provide wonderfully for those who are single and, and just sense that you've called them to a married life. I just pray that you would break, break through any boundaries or any demeaning words that have been spoken uh, into their lives that they would be uh, more than conquerors in, in their own view, Lord God. That we know that we are, but God, we can think ourselves down, we can talk ourselves down, we can believe the lies of the enemy. Speak against those in Jesus' name. We just speak power, Lord God, that it's a good thing uh, to, be, uh, to be single and to be able to spend our time devoted to you, Lord. But God, we also know that marriage is a, is a great thing. It's, you said it is good. Uh, and I just pray that, Lord God, that there would be uh, real real provision of, of blessing of romance, love, family uh, in the lives of those who are watching and uh, and beyond, Lord God, that you just bring a bring a wave of, of blessing and provision in that in that area for all those who are in that season of, of wait. Um, and those who are single and, and have committed to celibacy and you, you've called them to that, I just pray that they would be they would be faithful in that and that they would not be discouraged by everyone else's uh, myopia uh, on this on the situation but Lord God whatever their situation is I just pray that you would bless them and bring the very best uh, in their calling and help them be faithful and obedient in it uh, regardless of what everyone else says God help them always go back to you and your word and, and test the words that have been spoken and so I pray all that Lord in Jesus name and again with great thanksgiving we praise you Lord you're wonderful and I just yeah I just bring that before you in, in a just Heart of worship, Lord, thank you so much for, for being a great God uh, and being a God who provides and being a God who speaks life. And I pray that in everyone's lives, Lord, that they would experience you like never before in an awesome way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, cool. Thanks for stopping by for the, the webcast. Uh, I want to show you one more thing. 
this is this is uh this is related to Turbo Bible. Um Turbo Bible's fast, okay? Uh but I really wanted to recode it cuz I was going to finish up a few bugs, uh fixing a few bugs, but if I went back to the code right now, I'm I uh, I kind of fear that I would just totally mess up the code cuz when you step away from code for a while and you go back to it, it's it's kind of a risk to go back and try to change it cuz you know, you're probably pulling a string that's going to affect something else and it's going to cause another bug and then you're not going to know, well, right off uh, what's wrong. So, um, I'm going to load up Visual Studio here and Turbo Bible C Sharp. Oh, man. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is what I have so far. It's the same type of format and I have the copyright and all that, but... And this is, of course, just a total, total non-build yet. But uh, if, if I want to go to James 4.1, and uh, I don't have the enter key working on that text box yet, uh, I will, <laughs> Lord willing, if he gives me the time to do it. Um, I trust he will. Oh, whoops, 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 whoops. <laughs> Restarting. I have a watch on that one to test the RTF parsing. But... Um, but the cool part is, well, uh, if I totally misspell Genesis, I'm like Genesis with a Y. I can go to Genesis 4. It's going to correct it to Genesis 4.1 or first Corinthians. <laughs> it's first Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. It's pretty smart. I have a, a scoring system now for like a match. So it's it's pretty accurate, and uh, I'm pretty happy with it because if you, if you look at the old... To the Turbo Bible that I use, if I type in first Corinthians, yeah, it's gonna go to Genesis because <laughs> it's like I don't know what this is, so I'm gonna default to Genesis, and I've always defaulted to Genesis in this one. Um, I actually tried to default to John 14:6, but um, I didn't want to be annoying with that, so I don't know why I just chose Genesis because it's index is zero, I guess. But this one has a whole lot better recognition, but also has a history which. Whenever I would use this and I would be preaching, I'm like, you know, it would be really neat to have a navigation in here. So I'm like, I want to go back one, or right, back to Genesis. I want to go forward one. I want to view my history. Pretty cool. So that's one feature I wanted to add, and I just thought, oh, well, I should probably just restart. Uh, and the thing is, too, I'm also sending everything to RTF format natively. So it's an RTF text box, rich text box. Uh, what I was doing before is I just sent it a bunch of text and then I formatted it individually from the from kind of like a pseudo UI side. Um, but this one I'm, I'm doing it natively and so I'm formatting everything before I put it to the box and just sending it once. Uh, it's about a, on, if you load the whole book of Psalms, uh, it turns a about, uh, on, on this computer, it's about a 90% performance increase on that search and that's going to be the most demanding one that you have. And it's going to increase the performance of everything. So um, in doing that, I'm just making sure that my formatting is right. I know this is an ugly format, but I just had the font color different so I could actually make sure that the RTF was correct. Um, so that's what I've been working on really this week. But uh, I want to get all these bugs fixed. And I, I think the, the best way to do that at this point is just write it here. And since it's in C Sharp as well, I can also port that to Android and uh, iOS if I go with Xamarin. Uh, so all you code code heads, I guess. <laughs> Coders, <laughs> code heads. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, that's 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 what's been going on. So um, you can still, oh, I still have that watch. Um, let me just comment this out and get rid of that watch. But you can still do stuff like. There's still some things to, to fix there, but you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, some neat features on Turbo Bible already that I'm gonna keep keep going with. Like if you if you select the splitter, and then you use Control and Scroll Wheel, you notice that the interface gets bigger. That's really helpful when you get to uh, big monitors and you need to use it there. You can always zoom in, zoom out on this, and then when you switch books, it'll it'll preserve at least the integer value of the zoom. That's the limitation on the box. Um, but, uh, but again, you can, you can zoom in, zoom out with control scroll wheel. That's kind of neat. Uh, you can set your search ranges. I have that set. I just, I need to put the text or the, uh, 
combo box in, drop down list box. This is also called a combo box because you can also type in it too, which is neat. Um, I need to fix the layout here, that type of thing. So layout here. Do you see that? Oh, it's bound to that whole window. Let me just show it on here. Um, here. Yeah. Get the replace out. There we go. Yeah, so you see the concordance here. So with double honor, you search for that, or you can search in quotations. Um, what was the actual terminology? It was first Timothy 5.17. Double O. Double honor. That was it. Yep. <laughs> you can search in both terms, but I forget. This is K this is KJV. You get my honor. Um okay. Well, zoom in zoom out as you want uh yep i just want to make it fully customizable and just have that work and that's about it <laughs> but uh, i just want to show that i'm, I'm going to have that as I, I really want that to be a help to those who need a quick bible app uh, both on windows and on uh, tablets and that type of thing and, and smartphones because it's just my experience with U version. It's way too much stuff for me, and it and I have a dual core tablet, and one you have to be connected to the internet to have most of its features, and then two, it takes thirty seconds plus to load on my on my tablet. It's like uh, with with this one, you just you click, oh, it's here. And it's the previous passage you were on. It's like cool. That's just what I want. I just want to read the Bible. I don't want to like report to my my tweet buddies, my tweeps. Uh, I just read this chapter. I just, I just want to read the Word of God uh, and not wait 30 seconds for the internet to try to connect and need to download all the live events in the area. Um, that can have its use, and that's great, and LifeChurch.tv has done a great job with that, but I just want to make an alternative that's actually useful to, to people who just want a quick, uh, quick load Bible app. And this one you can take personal notes to, save it as RTF, all that. And uh, I adjusted the go let's make the interface a little bit smaller here there we go but eh, you can't see the personal notes either let's <laughs> if I scroll this over I think you can yeah so you see all the personal notes that type of thing let me get that lined up there we go all right but anyway that's all I got for this week and I hope that you are blessed and I, I pray that you're blessed and that you go and whatever God calls you to in leadership, that you do that faithfully. And that, again, we will all stand before the Lord and, and he'll say, well done, thou good and thou faithful servant. And, and he has such a heart of love for you. Uh, I hope you believe that and take that and cherish that and that God blesses you this week. So, again, God bless you. Again, <laughs> may the blessings abound in your life and uh, may he shower you with his blessings this week god bless you and see you next week oh another thing um next week no tuesday it's gonna be a thursday i'm gonna be in virginia speaking at a few church plants up in virginia so um i will be doing that and i will be back on really wednesday but i'm gonna take a day and work and rest and get back into the swing of things but uh the 11th is going to be so thursday the 11th will be the next webcast so next week, Thursday, I hope to see you there. And again, we'll record it if you can't make it, but we hope to see you here. God bless you, and again, go and be blessed.